Keep Hi, it's 6.38 p.m. on this wonderful September 5th. We're going to get this meeting called to order. Right to me? Yep. Okay. All right. <laughs> Toughest job I've had. <laughs> um, we have a slideshow for you here. We're going to talk about fund balance. I slideshow tab. Um, this is a abbreviated version of what you saw in June when we talked about this, this conversation, uh, but it builds on where we think we left that conversation and then some of the steps we're gonna need to take looking to where we're going. I will highlight there are four sets of documents that are available to the public online, uh, but we emailed to all of you uh, that are models. We're gonna reference them tonight. I'm not gonna put them on the screen. Many of those Excel sheets are multiple tabs that are like actuarial reports for the risk studies. So I want you to just be aware we have those uh, and then people can find them online. Go ahead. Okay. You want to ask, ask questions as we go along? Or I think so, yes. Yeah. Okay. So well, I'll explain what, what we think we're going to do, and then you can tell us what you need to have filled in around those spaces. Um, we're just going to go quickly over the discussion points that we ended our last meeting at, and sort of recap where staff believe the direction was given, and where we don't have it fully yet. Uh, we're going to refresh the key items that we talked about in June. That uh, I'll just give you that jog memory that what we need to talk about today: the fund balance status, the current policy, the challenges within the language of it, and then you know whether or not we move to a much more expansive model, um, reserves as an insurance model, and reserves as a savings model. We talked about those two fundamental themes last time. And then out of that are discussion points, and uh, Dr. Peoples, I added these. Uh, they really some surmise the two points, the, the two slides at the end where we're asking you for all that feedback is how start thinking about a data informed policy. I'll give you an example. We may think 40% of the budget sounds like a really low number to have, but what if the data says only 10% of the budget to be saved, you know, for a, a, a revenue loss, right? So how do we overcome the human decision making and our, our own risk aversion and our own loss uh, factors and such? I uh, really use the data. So how do you prepare yourself for that? And you don't have to follow the data either. You can make other decisions as policymakers. Uh, and then we're going to have extra reserve funds beyond what the city needs. We would be like we would be triple insured problem. Um, you know, if we if we kept all that we have in the sense of a reserve for those those fundamental functions. So what do we do with those extra reserve funds? Uh, and the reason that last time, you know, Council Member, you talked to you, sort of that language between what's the fund balance, what's the reserve, and do we really, we have reserves now. We do, but technically reserves mean you reserved it for something. We have never as a city said, this big pot of money is reserved for, right? And that's that's one of the, the questions we're going to ask. Where does that go? You know, where does, where does one-time money, a lot of one-time money, get invested uh, on behalf of the city? So... That kind of question. You don't have to answer that tonight. But that's the, the sort of questions that we're posing with this conversation as well. Because when you talk about fund balance policy, you're also talking about what's the appropriate amount to keep on cash on hand versus what you're taxing and operating. Okay. Councilman Smith, questions yet? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> so um, this is where we ended our conversation last time. And so these orange are what we think are staff directions that we have, what we surmised from your conversations. We talked about the GFOA rethinking model. You said yes, and it sounds appropriate for us. That's what we took away as direction. If we are wrong on what direction is, please tell us and we will, you know, we can pivot on that regard. Um, we talked about a risk-based revenue analysis, um, that, that tool, using the tools to do an actual data dive on our, 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 our exposure. Uh, you found out, we inferred that you agreed with that model to do that, that kind of a process. To your knowledge, have we ever had any type of risk-based review of anything or anything pertaining to insurance or risk for? Yeah, yes. So we do have facilities. Yeah. We do have risk analyses that come through. They do walk through and they do workers' comp risk analyses or a a liability analysis. So the insurance company does come through. You know, this piece of park equipment looks like it could have a a, a screw sticking up that can cause cuts and injuries and things like. They have done a lot of that. We've been looking at that, especially with workers' comp. Uh, I think looking at auto liability now uh, and where those rates have gone, we certainly, it's incumbent on us to look at some of those, but we've never done it on the revenue side. What happens when the, the bad thing happens in Webster Groves, right? What is the bad thing? What are we, what's the probable bad thing out of all the list of bad things that could happen? And how do we weather that storm, whether it be an actual storm or something else when it comes? 
Well, would that risk analysis also include uh, we have piece of equipment A. Mm -hmm. It's been working fine, but is uh, amortized off the books, mm -hmm. passes life cycle, and we carry some type of insurance on it in case something happens. Is it cheaper to carry the insurance or is it cheaper just to buy it when it breaks down? Buy it when? Yeah. I don't think we've had that, that kind of, the numbers have been playing on the back of the envelope math until this year that it didn't matter. It was just cheaper to keep the insurance right to be able to repurchase that product through an insurance claim mm -hmm. and such. Now with the changes in our insurance liabilities and the claims and deductions, now that's a bigger question of, is there worth, you know, the truck that we'll probably get 15,000 for having to deal with a multi-thousand dollar claim um, and then a massive deductible or is it, is, do we just avoid insurance on it all together? Because yeah. part of revenue is, can we decrease any of our expenses mm -hmm. to bolster revenue by what we don't need? This limit of uh, insurance on this particular piece of equipment. Maybe we drop it. If we need it, just increase it to a point where the deductible is decreasing the cost of our insurance. I, Can you remind the group? And for people watching, yes. um, what our deductibles increased to? Because yeah. it really did change how we view things. It, it did change. So, I mean, light vehicles, I believe, went to almost almost fifteen thousand dollars. Light vehicles. So we're talking just a basic car, truck, fifteen thousand dollars deductible. Of course, you know, most of our household policies were paying the pain thousands. Some of us pay five hundred. Some people maybe pay two thousand. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. Let's, you know, if we don't need the coverage, let's pull it down. Our whole policy, so you know overall, mm -hmm. essentially what happened to the city and happened to all the members of Slate was deductibles all went up, premiums all went up, the value of our vehicles still is going up and such, all of our claim coverages came down. So to make it somewhat affordable, Slate gave us less insurance with more of our own cost kicked into that insurance to be able to do that. And essentially, in some ways, some of this, I, I believe, with my words, falls on slate for not every year giving us a little bite of that increase. And we've held it, I held it back. And now it's come due because the, the Chubb and the other insurers that do play in the, the public sector market aren't going to wait for us to get caught up like that in a slow process. But also part of it is just simply, you know, a lot of different factors and their weather changes, hail damage on cars and such, just with weather changes has caused more claims and roofs and things like that. Um, they are our commercial vehicles. This is the, the one that just got me. That like so we're talking about the big fire truck here, right? Or a, a dump truck and such. Two hundred fifty thousand dollar deductible for for a for a dump truck. That's almost a dump. Truck. That's almost almost fully pledged out every bell and whistle you can think of dump truck for Webster Girls. And so that is now our deductible on a, on a large commercial vehicle. Mm -hmm. Now that's our dump trucks. That's going to be the fire fire engine. Certainly that still is less than the cost of the engines, but an ambulance, you know, now is that value? Is the, is the new ambulance, if it gets bumped up, is it really for $100,000 more, do we just get another new ambulance at some point? So. And that's something we could consider the reserve balance. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. And not to tear down too much on insurance, because I know we have other mm -hmm. stuff to talk about too, but how does it, like, do we pay per vehicle? Do we pay as a, like an overall amount to the city that encompasses everything? We pay an overall amount for the city that encompasses all things, but there's all on a property listing. So we are we list every vehicle that we have, and we by practice and, and by good good reason include every vehicle, even the, the couple cars that maybe move a couple times a month at most, or you know, small trucks. But all of them that touch a road are all insured. And you've got the sort of off-road vehicles, the tractors and such like that at Public Works. They're all included. All of our facilities are included in that package. And then you're dealing with also workers' comp is coming through there, a liability for public and such, you know, sidewalk trips and things like that. So, so if we pick like this one doesn't need replacement coverage and this one does, does that actually change our overall cost very much? Or it, it could. You could reduce the number of claimed vehicles and such. But again, so there's there comes a tipping point where you're not getting any value out of that, or you are, you know, yeah. and so or you may have to remove so many that you can't get that many to take off the list, right? right. Um, some of that is, I wish Slate was a little more open about the formula. You know what I mean? It's not like I can just go get it and tell you exactly, like, we pull this out, it'll give us this. It's, you sort of have to piece out, uh, what's the pricing formula and how's this work? What do you do with this list we send you? 
to come up with that number at the end. Mm -hmm. Must we use slate? Yes. So we must use slate unless you're going to willing to forego what we have invested in the trust there. We have about 400,000, I think, in property. Well, that was in 22. Right. So I'm property. sure it's increased significantly. At that time, if we were to leave slate, then we would be foregoing. 435,000, if I remember correctly. And there's a property trust and a health trust, just to be clear on that. It's like there's two different sides of slate. Thing. So, okay. We've been in property with slate for many years. Health is the recent addition, slate, uh, to, in terms of slate. So, as we do a, a risk based analysis, you look at revenue, you look at all the possibilities and all the, the different things that come out of that, including then your spending. So, to the fleet, like what's your replacement plan? You know, in 10 years, we're going to need to buy a fire truck. So, that's built into all this already. What are you, do you go with a range of required reserves? Many of our counterparts have, we want to have between 10% to 20% of the budget. We want to have between $3 million and $5 million. You can have different uh, values there. Or do we have a fixed target like we have? We want to be at 50% of the, of the general fund budget on our current policy. We didn't get an answer on that because I didn't expect to get an answer on that. That's part of this, what the tool is going to tell us. But these are the data points to start thinking about, right? If it says 10%, but you're like, I can tell my neighbor that we only need 10% and it sounds credible, right? You know, those are the kinds of things that we need to think about in applying data to policy conversations as well. And then is there, is there a minimum and maximum? You know, so if we have a $22 million budget in the general fund like we have now, and we have $13 million sitting in the fund balance for the general fund, well over you know, almost 60% of the, of the budget and such, 65 64% this year, is there a maximum number? That starts to trigger, now you go into a spending plan or you go into a diversion plan to pull out of that and get it into a reserve for a certain purpose. And then you've hit a floor and you hit a minimum. All of a sudden you're going below. What's the what's the refill triggers that go into that, right? Do we want those triggers or is it just simply like we have it now? Somebody come up with a plan. That's pretty much what it is now. Who's going to come up with a plan? Fix it. So. But that can be part of the annual budget. Can be part of the annual budget, yes. That if you, yes. So, often, but again, I think what we talked about one of the visions of the GFOA conversation is to predetermine a lot of those triggers and outcomes, so you know where it's going, so you're not caught in the emotional moment of there's loss happening, right? Economy's downturned and such. We're going to go. We need to go over here, right? And you pivot the whole organization. Right? There's a there's a plan built behind it, <clears throat> theoretically built to the strategic plan and all those the conversations of where investments need to happen, but. Plans are written down for a reason, so they can be changed if they need to be. So. Uh, number three that we talked about, comprehensive reserve policy. This sort of speaks to what we just talked about. You said, yes, we should do that. And these are some of the big policy conversations. Uh, we talked about a rainy day fund. That's, again, the rate, most rainy day funds have the trigger. So we're going to hold this amount of money. If revenue dips by this amount, we're going to dig into that rainy day fund type of thing. Some rainy day funds don't have a trigger. Some of them are just like ours. They just exist. You know, you guys decide when you need to take them out and use it. So. Uh, take money out of it. And then the last one is, where do we see reserves going? So if we have these extra reserves that we don't need to hold for covering our risk, where are we going to put that money, right? Or does we, do we just sit and invest it? That's it. Now you can do that, but if you want to do investments in things, what are those things that you're working towards? And because we have to motivate a community engagement, you know, plan for those things and identify those areas. And are they just the strategic plan or is it other areas? So that's where we think we left staff direction at our, our June meeting, okay? So Eric, yep. Yep. I believe we have prioritization coming up in one of the work session meetings where councils kind of talk about priorities. We're gonna discuss where we're at with strategic plan as well as Eric just said. For me, that really goes to number three. And so perhaps that question waits until after the prioritization conversation, but there's a lot of big ticket items right now on the horizon, whether it's stormwater, doing more with sustainability, uh, art discussion that we had this week. There's just a lot of big things that are important to the community and to council. And so how do they play into this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll see what recommendations come from the comprehensive plan too. That might be. Oh, well, it's a whole other set of money. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just to take you back. Our fund balance uh, right now, uh, we the final numbers that we had to do a real quick recalculate are about 64.5% once we with the adopted budget for this year. So we have a very strong and healthy fund balance. Our, our monies in the general fund that aren't budgeted. Remember, fund balance is everything that's left over in the general fund that isn't part of the budget. So we have well over, well over, four, almost $14 million just there in the fund balance. 
the unassigned portion, the really the piece that you I don't say get to play with, but has sort of discretionary free use right now is about 11 and a half million. And so, and some of those funds will become more discretionary as they, they loosen up. You know, I mean, that's uh, you wait for the final ARPA certification to come back and then you've got all your revenue losses, you know, released. And so you can say it's all revenue loss and there you go. Um, so little things like that, you know, that number will grow and it'll change as we go through quarterly reports, but you've got a lot of funds still sitting there. Essentially, we talk about, we sold the water system for $12 million. That money went into that fund balance. It's pretty much still there. We pretty much have that still there and available. Almost 20 years later, I suppose. Is it 10? I think it's 21. 21, yeah. 2001. 2001. So, so we have we have a good chunk of that money. We've replenished a few little bits of it here and there. We've taken out of it in the, in the bad years as well, but we have a strong chunk of that principle is still remaining, if not all of it. So we talked about our current policy. If you remember, it's a target. It's not a requirement. We're supposed to try to have a goal of 50%, but it's not a cut requirement. So if we fall below that, we don't fix it. It's What's the, there's no penalty, you know, it doesn't do anything. It just fell below 50%. It doesn't have to be a requirement or a penalty either. I'm just saying it's, you know, is it going to be a target or a requirement? What's our conversation? The rolling beginning balance is what they used when they wrote the current policy. And remember, we talk about how hard that is to do because you have to take all the estimates for the current year you're in at about six months through, and then you're constantly reworking that estimate to give you where you're going to start your budget year from. And then as you make changes to the budget, you're making changes on that side of that balance sheet as well. So... So that's a, that's a tough number to use. Understandably why they wanted to use it. What are we going to start this budget at? Is it below 50%? I get it, but it's real tough because you have so few data to really help you out on the, on the current year. And what, what are other options of numbers they could pick? You, you can go to a closing year balance. Um, you can you could look at the same thing if you, I think really what it is is we, you're giving right now estimation power. Is It's really what Maria and I do. We estimate what the end of the year, the departments give us their first estimates, then we look at those estimates. In January, when they open the budget, into March, when they submit their budgets, what do you expect to do in that fiscal year for the remaining few months? You know, what you've done and what you expect to do, what's that total going to be? And that's driven by, that's put in by departments. We review it uh, for, for credibility and such, but it's also, those are just, those sometimes are numbers that you don't know what's going to happen, right? And so is there a better way uh, to build in what those estimates look like on the backside. You know, is there is there an actual formula to estimation that we should be using in standard practice? We haven't done that. Departments have different ways of estimating what they're going to be. And everyone just assumes they're going to spend their salary. And we always have salary savings. You know, you just have people that are changing over, right? And so you always have a saving there that adds to the fund balance, which is good for the city, but ultimately it, does, it gives you, doesn't give you the truest picture of what you actually have available on the table. If we were a much tighter cash organization, it would be really important for cash flow, right? This We've never had to do a cash flow analysis here, ever. We never have to worry about it. We have enough money in the bank to cut any check we need right now today. Um, and so, but if we were a tighter organization, if we do spend this down, we have to start looking at that. When do funds come in? How do we hold monies? How do we borrow from one fund that's got money now because it's a property tax fund waiting for the big sales tax months to come in for this other fund, right? And that's, that's what other cities do to balance those funds out, so... Based on your experience in city management, for example, any <clears throat> um, councils have uh, made that fund balance as part of their budgetary. We don't want the fund balance to go beyond below this. And when you start looking at expenses and revenues for the current year, uh, you say, okay, if we spend this much, we're not going to achieve this fund balance. Mm -hmm. So every city, every city that's going to do bonding is going to have a fund balance policy because you're you're going to end up on the bottom end of a Moody's or a, a S&P standard rankings with with nothing, with no rating if you're not or the bad rating, excuse me, if you don't have those kind of policies. This is why when we did before we did the 2011 bonds for the concrete roads, that's when most of these policies we're reviewing were first implemented brought in because, okay, we, we're going to take a big debt package out. We need to be better rated, get the best deal we can. And so that's where a lot of this came from. You look at the years of these. But they just used the number they had. Not they, I think they used a lot of comparables around us. There's a lot of 50% around us here. Um, and there are, but there are hard requirements in some cities. I think of like De Pere, I think was one of them that is 50, like us, their goal is 50. I think they're well over 70. But their minimum, their fall bottom minimum is 35, which still is a lot of money. And that city could run for a 
many months on that 35%, um, but they have to do some drastic changes. There's a trigger there that requires, you know, it's a, understood this is a policy of the city and this triggers get these steps are going to happen. And actually that's really what a risk, the risk analysis that we're talking about gives us as well. <laughs> if you have, uh, when you look at those documents and you all can open up, you can modify them, you can play with them, but it's going to look at what happens if we're, if we're in an earthquake area and we get the big one, right? And we have to go to continuity of operations. This building doesn't exist. We've got to move buildings. What's those costs going to be? What do we move? What do we need to cover that kind of action, that kind of cost? What's insurance kicking in? What are we not? Um, so that gives you a better sense of what that number is. It's not just a guess. It's literally an actuarial type of table that is being applied there. So, okay. Um, the other thing about our policy, it just says the city will fix it in the budget proposal. Well, the budget proposal is the city manager, but she's not the city. The city is all of you. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Put down a t-shirt. And then of course. <laughs> This policy says we're supposed to review it every two years, which we, we do through the budget process. We all know this. We look at this number, but the policy itself is every two years, and then but we review everyone else. It's been a three-year rolling cycle in these reviews. So those are the problems with our current policy that we talked about last time, just to give you that backstop. Why don't we just keep doing what we're doing? Even if we want to do that 50% number, there's some other things we have to fix within that to sort of give us better direction. And also to understand your role as the legislative body. What's your powers and what's the management's powers to be able to manage the budget once once delivered? Have you ever wondered why biannual means once every two years and not twice a year? <laughs> <laughs> biannual? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I looked it up here. Okay. Like, <laughs> I'm the biannual sale. Yeah. And Sid Kansas will be your state auditor. <laughs> <laughs> the English language. So glad we are talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. This 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 conversation gives me anxiety. So, <laughs> well, so I, I understand how that. I so, deal with it. <laughs> so, as one who deals with insurance, here we go. Let's talk about some insurance. So, uh, so again, risk based revenue analysis. What do we need for extreme events? For revenue stability for when we have an expenditure volatility when prices shoot up with in in uh, inflationary times. What do we have to do? What do we need for leverage? What's our liquidity? What's other funds needs in there? Uh, what's our growth? What's our a projected growth? I mean, that's a piece of this, right? We don't talk about what our projected growth is. I know I mentioned it every time we do property taxes that we didn't grow enough, in my opinion. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's a conversation. And then what's our capital load? You know, at some point, if we need a new building, how do we fund that, right? How do we take care of that? And it's, you know, we, we, we rely on debt service. But if we're, if we have to do debt service because of a major event, and now you need another building, building after you get that done, how do you get to that point, right? And what do you need on that? And it's all data driven information. Look, it can be data driven information. So I want to be clear about that. We can give you data, give you out of that numbers, here's what we think those, that data is showing us. But again, elected officials aren't bound to say we have we have to follow the data. The data isn't there to guide you, but if data is not meeting the community value or the community comfort, that is not a that doesn't hold you to that, right? But there are competing emphases there, right? Do you want to be a data driven model? Do you want to be a a much more values driven model. And how do you find what they call the uh, Goldilocks zone uh, when you look at the GFOA slides that I sent out today between those two models, right? What feels right and what the data tells us we need to have, right? Okay, so like mm -hmm. De Pair has a 50%. Just like we do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like, I guess I'm just like wondering, like, that is taxpayer dollars. Those are taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. yes. And, but that what their community is comfortable with. Keeping on hand, that's a, like, a, like a blanket, like a comfy thing. I think you can honestly say that a community is comfortable if you will say that in their ignorance of that whole issue. Right. That they're comfortable. I don't know. No one goes out and spends a whole campaign on how much money you have in the bank right. until someone finds out you have all this money in the bank and you just raise taxes. Right? That's usually when these kinds of issues come up uh, in the political sense. But... How many of you campaigned on? We have thirteen million dollars in the bank. We need to keep it there, right? You know, I mean that that con that's never the that's usually not the conversation from the people. So I don't disagree with you. What I'm saying, what's the reason that they have they really endorsed that, or is it simply the byproduct of the community they are? That's what I'm getting. Well, municipal government philosophy has changed, and we're doing many more whether social activities, getting engaged in different areas, and so with the tide has really shifted in terms of how do we invest back in the community beyond basic streets and infrastructure, which is of course is incredibly important, but we're thinking about other things as well. 
I'm curious about yeah. that historically, just like when those types of shifts happen, just, you know, I've been listening to a lot of like planning for streets and stuff, yeah. podcasts and how this level of investment and discussion of investment back into infrastructure hasn't happened really since the post-World War II era. Mm -hmm. Um, well, in the post World War II area, era, we're building new infrastructure, right? Yeah. Building, we all, some, for some reason, building a new bridge, building a new freight road gets a lot of fanfare, but fixing the base, most basic road, right? A chip seal doesn't, we don't all run up press releases that the chip seal program, right? You know, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. So, but my, my point being is that we've always in this country had a problem with what do we do with the next round of infrastructure that comes behind the big thing we built? Yeah. So, as we've expanded cities, then, of course, you start to see the housing market move with them. Now you've got infill housing happening. And it does, it, does it happen at the same rate it happened in 1947, you know, on the edge of St. Louis City as people moved out? Not at all, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you constantly had that conversation across many different things, not just public infrastructure, but our housing market and, and other, other investments. <laughs> um, so in here, the, on the uh, as an insurance model, this could also give you the range. What's your, what do you really expect? You know, if you have that, those extreme events pack up, here's what we think you should have on hand. If you're gonna have none of them, here's your minimum. You know, is it 10%, is it 12%? Is it a whole dollar number? Uh, the floor of your, of a possible uh, policy. And again, human fear of loss. You know, again, what you're just talking about, council member, 40% feels like the right number to be. Mm -hmm. We've never, ever, 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 ever in this city, even before we had this $12 million, Gone anywhere close to forty percent out of the out of the fund balance. You know, I mean, we have been able to hold a, a much larger number. We've never drawn down that kind of money, you know, and such. Now that's many years ago on the budgets, but you just go back and look, and it's you know, we've always had revenue to meet it. And even in the tough years, we've made the changes, you know, that you're going to make so that you're not drawing down you know, massive amounts of millions. It's usually, again, you look at most cities, ten to twelve percent are probably easily justified keeping them running. We think of 29, we think of, you know, great crashes in, in time, but it's, the government has a generally revenue, a, a pretty good stable stream. We're a little more sales tax dependent than we probably would like to be, a little more volatility, but people still need to buy stuff ultimately. And we're a residential community where people are gonna buy stuff. They gotta have toilet paper, they gotta have, you know, sundries and such like that. So these groceries stay in the sales tax base. Legislature changes the yeah. sales tax base, that's a risk. Like that's something we would enact, and, analyze in this this conversation about the revenue tax base what are the the outside influences of the legislature changing the tax base if they said we had to lower tax rates by you know 10 percent what would that do for property taxes be great relief to a lot of homeowners but it would cause you know what's the revenue shift that we would have to deal with here well and that's not a that wouldn't be a surprise actually with this i, I mean if they get their act together and actually concentrate on mm -hmm. certain things at the I think it's probably our actual most legitimate yeah. threat to revenue is the legislature and preemption by the legislature. Yeah, I think yeah, I think our biggest threat is always from without, from outside than within. I think number two is within. I get to housing and, and building there. So I, I look at again. I come back to this is me, Eric Peterson, but I come back to our commercial growth. Right? How do we commercial value and our commercial real estate is where you know is so much more valuable. A smaller piece of commercial real estate is so much more valuable than a home because of the tax rate, because of the value of commercial property. But we haven't built any commercial property. Again, five years in a row, only one year, one one of the three business districts got a commercial net new construction. Everything else has been residential in this city. So we're not building commercial value. And, and that's I'm not arguing against the historic buildings one bit whatsoever, but you have a small, dense area, so are you building up? What are you building to give yourself more commercial room? What do you need for commercial room? You don't probably not going to have a big bank in the, the way we used to have it, but what is it? Is it, a, is it an office working space, a co-working space? What is that thing? And those commercial spaces are where we will make our bread and butter if we're not going to change the housing model. Well, isn't isn't the, the sales tax platform in St. Louis County based also on the fact that other municipalities are building new, then we're going to be okay as well because we share. By population. By population. So we all, so we, that's based on the population, the per capita populations of each, of each municipality based on the decennial yeah. census. So we, we had some, we had a growth in this last decennial census. 
you know, we had some years of a couple of censuses that we went down, but in general, we've mapped right along with the rest of the county up and down, right? So we're not seeing that area where if we jumped ahead by an extra 5%, the pool would, you know, because now we have that kind of population. I, I think I see what you're saying, and maybe I misstated what I was trying to say. I was just, effectively, I don't see this community increasing population at any significant speed uh, in any near future. And I think that's always been the argument is, well, if we don't have commercial, well, then we just increase population. Mm -hmm. I just don't see that happening, um, particularly because we're a way black city. It's obviously we went through Douglas, uh, Douglas Hill. It's difficult to build uh, in this community um, significant uh, multi-family units. So you're saying, in other words, if we're gonna if we're gonna increase our tax revenue, the best way of doing that is through commercial. Short of short of going more sales tax, uh, so I mean, sales tax we certainly are a rich factor in the city. Or increasing property, or, or yes, increasing property. If you're not going to increase the rates and such, yeah. your net new construction of commercial value gives you so much more bang for the buck. You get more money per. You get a value per acre. Take your parcels out of it. We took the and actually I would like to have this modeling done, but if we took the property taxes and got rid of the parcels and laid that down by what does it give us per acre? We hear this a lot from organizations like Strong Towns and other other places. They talk about land use value per acre. Then starts to show you where's your where's your your real property tax base coming out of the dense areas with higher values. And that, of course, that's going to be your commercial district areas, right? And so those areas that are already dense and all that that kind of infrastructure started being built in. How do we then net new construction in that? How do you add new buildings in that? Like I'm waiting to see 55 West Moody, the old bank drive through be built because that will be some of the first net new construction we'll see since my time here and I think for a few years before that. Mm -hmm. the, property, the one property that you mentioned, there, there was one property? There was one. Um, uh, well, Schnucks got a, a big net new construction because they're increased their increase, their whole new renovation throughout the oh. building. Um, they had a big assessment, but there was a, um, never mind, Tommy, I'm so sorry, Telly Tire, Telly Tire and Old Orchard. Oh. So when that shifted, that was considered a new construction because of a, a shift of the type of business and such. And it really, it really did change. That, that was a big jump on the tax base there um, that, that came through. They, and they moved the corporate office. They, they did. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but we still faced with <clears throat> our community. Still want this to be the nice, quaint, drive-through community, mm -hmm. and. We want all the other things that everybody else have, but we don't want to increase business and we don't want to increase taxes and housing. How you, you know, so we're going to stay right where we are and, and get nothing. It's going back to your point. And, and you have to have that, that business uh, growth in order to really move. And business growth to bring in people. If there's nothing to live here, to bring in uh, tax income into the area. So, fear of human loss again, forty percent is it too much, too little? We don't know yet. Well, the data will help us, but it get yourself prepared for that conversation, right? I mean, you know, I can go tell my my neighbors that thirty percent is enough, but what if it's twelve percent? Can you even say that? You know, and, and much less bring it. I don't mean to just look at two council member, but. Across my numbers and all of us here, uh, including myself, you know, what what's up? So, <laughs> and, and then I, I just want to, the, the big what if, you know, we always talk about the what if. We just lived through pandemic and actually the largest downturn of revenue as we look at it, you know, prorated across the years that the city's ever seen. So appreciate in, this. Sorry. It's fine. Please go ahead. I just think it's like really helpful as a reminder that was bonkers what we just experienced and are still recovering from. Yeah. Um, and what did it look like, like, and I should know this, but what impact did it have on us? And we were also then changing the way we were running things and budgets. And I mean, that like all these things at one time. So like, how, how did that, and uh, forgive me, Eric, if mm -hmm. you've already said this, like, how did that impact our general fund? So we survived the rainy day. We survived the rainy day. Here, we'll probably state it better. We had an impact and it hurt. Obviously, we had some layoffs. Yeah. We really tightened the belt, so to speak. I think had we had a better handle on where we were across the board, whether we're talking deferred maintenance mm -hmm. of facilities, um, 
keeping up with our vehicles, other things, reviewing health care, reviewing some of our other benefits, I don't think the impact would have been as bad. Mm -hmm. But because we did have a healthy reserve, and our operations have been pretty status quo for a while, the, the impact didn't hit as hard. And federal aid. So I just yeah. add federal aid into that too. So. Right. And I think that's a bigger question with the what if, like, mm -hmm. will that federal aid come cool. next time? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, you talk about right. earthquakes. I mean, I mean, we're due for one. Salt Lake report because they have earthquakes in the rest there too, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, um, next month or next mm -hmm. week. <laughs> well, and then the other thing that I think that the extreme events now is also cybersecurity. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's again, it's at least how I look at it, mm -hmm. and like what I've read is like every business is bound to get hit at some point in its life tenure. Uh, and, and same thing with just the average citizen, I think. And the question is, well, how much does that cost? Right. So we, we face thousands of attack, attacks every day. Yeah. They get stopped. Some get slid through, and it's our employees that become our front line. Yeah. But one wrong click, and we're in a ransomware where they're saying, we know you have $13 million in the bank. Yeah. And you have an insurance policy for $2 million. We want $15 million to give you your data back and let you go a bunch of way. Should we be? This gets to the conversation about an on-premises server, you know, all those backups, where is that all happening? Uh, that's why we went to the government cloud in a way, uh, but all those steps that we need to make. But, but you're absolutely right, because number one threat in terms of cybersecurity is ransomware for local government, because they can lock us up and we got to have this data. You know? All your building permits, your occupancy uh, inspections and all that are, are locked in there. So to answer your question in a, in a, in a different way, but also the same, we and to what we're talking about here. When we encountered COVID-19, I was not here, but I'm looking back at the actions we took and you can see them in the budget sort of process and the, the values that are there. We really said we're gonna keep the employees whole, right? We're gonna hang on and try to help pull people through the time. That's not a bad thing to do, but we had no plan on what we were gonna fund behind it, yeah. right? So this conversation now is okay, so we're gonna encounter a, a tough time. Do we make a small adjustment and you know, don't keep all 90, you know, don't keep all 100%, but keep 98% of your organization whole and make some of that small trim affecting, envisioning that you might come out the other side still with some danger zones. Mm -hmm. We really came out of the COVID zone into now a structural deficit issue because we, we kept everyone whole through that time. I mean, we used a lot of federal aid, the CARES Act money, 1.8 million, went right into the fire department to back out 1.8 million to go you know, help support Parks and Rec and Public Works and planning and development staff and all the other staff. So that that kind of conversation that I'm talking about, what are the triggers? What does that pre-planning look like? If you had, if that had been here before heading into the COVID pandemic, you would have been able to say, we're going to take it down to 98% of budget, meaning our, we're to pull our expenditures back. We're going to cut 2% off. We, we go find that, management goes and finds that, and then what's that mean coming out of that? We're going to hold that line so that we, we know we're a little neater than we were before we got into this to see what the, the new world looks like coming out the other side. And I, I, I think that was, a, frankly, the unwritten policy of Web Service because I think we did the exact same in the 08 financial crisis. We kept everyone whole mm -hmm. as the object. Right. And, and maybe that is what our policy should be. I'm not saying I'm advocating one way or the other right now, but I think that was probably the unwritten policy for a long time in this city. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, back to our reserve conversations. Reserve for what, right? I mean, what's the policy behind this money that sits in this big the big checking mm -hmm. and investments? So I will quickly move through this and we'll get into those discussion points. Uh, this is all important conversation, so I appreciate it. Again, comprehensive reserve policy, what we just talked about. Do you pre-commit to decisions about reserves? So you know what's going to happen before the emergency hits you, right? You know, and so Dr. Peoples and I, you know, we start to see sales tax dip, right? We're not waiting for a quarterly outcome, right? It's like, you know, we start to notify council and there may be a trigger that's neat. You know, sales tax took a 25% dip two months in a row. You know, that's a big number for Webster Growth that that happens. That's you know, about $8.9 million out of 22 is sales tax, 22 million. So if that dips like that, what are we doing as management right away to step in on that? There is no policy. There's no direction yet. It's, it's wholly, a, you know, the manager could not do anything and let the organization ride it out, right, and such. So, again, what is the written policy? Try to have that pre-game, a pre-plan out there as well. And then, so why are we reserving? Why are we accumulating reserves, right? To the public, why are we taxing you and holding on to your money rather than investing it back into the costs and goods of things that the, the public would desire to be operating 
How much should be accumulated? When do we have too much on hand? Right? And that's a thing in government. We have too much because again, you're about the fundamental views of taxing to take that money out of out of private citizens' hands, put it in the public's hands, writ large, and invest in public entities. What strategies do we use for accumulation? Again, how much are we investing? That's liquidity rates and such like that. How much are we trying to grow that with the principle that we put in? And then when and for what purpose do we use those revenues for? What do we take that? Are we taking interest only? Are we are we doing a big investment? Are we putting aside the housing trust fund? Are we creating the climate resiliency fund? Is this how we're going to fund it? You know, and such along the way. Those kinds of questions, which there's lots of things on the table, right? How do we catch up on buildings? You know, and if we, you know, if the assessment on uh, accessibility and security comes back and says this building really is going to be tough to do, it's going to take many millions of dollars. Is this the building where City Hall operates? You know, I'm not saying City Hall is going to move, but is that you know those kinds of conversations? That's what can can be come out come out of those conversations. And so that leads us then I, what we put together as the tool the conversation pieces for you tonight. And I'll move all these little boxes out of the way as best I can. Yeah. So. On the risk-based revenue analysis, it's, it's a model comprehensive tool. We have three different examples that I gave you in the GFOA materials and their, their conversation. That was actually a webinar they presented to finance staff. Uh, we, uh, we've asked them and they've agreed to give us the videos. So uh, Steve is in the process of getting that. When we have that, we'll get that available to you all to watch the actual webinar uh, that, that finance staff sat through. Uh, but the tools give us data. And so our considerations we're asking you to look at again is, if you're gonna have a policy, you generally either have a range or you have a fixed target. We right now have a fixed target. We want 50%, right? First of all, are we talking percentages or are we talking a whole dollar? You can, we can have a whole dollar. Data is gonna inform this, but again, your comfort with what data guides you to and taking that to people and, and also encouraging the people of Webster Groves to grow comfortable with it is important. If there is a range, what is that range? Is it, well, I've seen some, some places that are eight to 14%. I've seen some places that literally are our minimum floor is 10%, and we can take up to 80% of the budget. Moment. But the point is they've written it down. And people know then what that's for, right? If they've got a, a reason for why they want to hold it. Um, or fixed target number again, like our 50%. The minimum and maximum, really what I'm talking about there, are there triggers? Is there, when we reach a certain point, things happen, right? We've got too much money. Or do we come back and have a year-long conversation like this about what do we do with this money, right? Or do we know we have excess Excess of surplus of surplus funds. We're going to start investing in this strategic plan initiative piece that was sort of over here without a direct revenue stream. We need to put some money behind it. Or this one's falling behind. We don't have enough money to get this project really going. How do we how do we put money down? And then what are those triggers for accessing that? So I have two slides here, but this is really about the out of the risk-based analysis. What kind of what does that data teach us? And what's your comfort then with what that data will teach us? And that data is not going to be here for at least nine months, folks. I mean, between what, all the things we have to do in finance and then put our time into this, it'll take some time, uh, barring bringing someone else on to do it or some outside help. But but it's going to, that's okay, because you still have value-based conversations that you're going to be wanting to have on the, the, the opposite side of that. What are we going to do with funds? Yeah, that was my my ask. Is so that big spreadsheet with all the tabs, mm -hmm. we're, planning, we're planning to do that in-house. Yeah. So that kind of yeah. House. So we started with that conversation, and, and we could do it in house. It's going to take a long time, right? It's one of those that you you get a good week at it, and then you know the next big thing in finance comes up. And we all come back to it. Do we look at bringing in an outside person in that role in that space to do that? An outside firm or you know someone just on the employee side? I think that's all on the table from my perspective. There's a lot of things to do in finance. I don't expect to have a department of you know grow by three more people anytime soon. But this is really I, I see this as a project. Once this kind of thing is built and operating and it's integral to our financial life, then it's one of those things that you're updating year over year over year. Um, but do we have the expertise and staff now to build a model of this nature? That, to build that don't soak up all their time. Yeah, no, to build no. I mean, that's why GFOA has been so helpful, right? I mean, these are models that are operating, that have gone through the, 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 the folks that you see presenting on these, Shane Cavanaugh especially, is the brain at GFWA behind rethinking. And he, along with peers, academic you know, papers and things like that, peer reviewed, uh, have really put time and effort into this whole rethinking world that they're in. Um, they, they really have said, these are good models, right? You know, so they're giving us good models with a lot of rigor behind it to, to get real data, not just to have some big assumptions built in that you're like, but who decided that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Down that rabbit hole that you go in. Um, so it's very much more actuarial. 
if we had to build it from whole cloth, we do not have that on staff. So, but we, but that said, it's still it's tough to operate. We're talking about a model that's not built in our system. So you're constantly going in to get data out, apply it in this model. It's not integral. Sorry. It's very manual yeah. in that way. So can we just update that to a certain degree our financial? And every every day we continue to update all those things that. So we're in a system called New World from Tyler. Yeah. New World is now at end of life. So Tyler bought New World. It was a separate company. The Tyler Corporation bought it um, after we got into New World in 2005. That's coming to end of life, which is part of this IT conversation because we're on-premises server. We are not in the cloud with our financial data. We're on-premises down in the basement. And so sooner or later, Tyler will no longer allow on-premises servers. And they're not going to also service the new world product, right? We certainly don't want to be one of the last people on the boat, you know what I mean? As they're not helping us take care of it. It's already, we talk about payroll issues, you know, little errors here and there. Our patches have gotten so much easier. Why? Because Tyler's not pushing new stuff into the system, right? Because they're not updating that system anymore. So it's gotten easier already to maintain it, but that means sooner or later, it's going to get much harder because there's no fixes being built for things. And it's, how do we move? So you're, that IT plan is really going to say, how do we get to the cloud? And then we are probably two to four years away from an ERP, an ERP transfer. You can stay in the Tyler world and go into their, their the Tyler product original. It's called Munis or ERP Pro. Uh, so Dr. Peoples and I used in Arizona uh, when we were there and other, other many other places use it. We can go out on the market, look at Oracle. We can look at Workday. We can take our pick of ERPs. But it's everything you've seen in New World that sooner or later has to be brought into a new system. That's a whole two-year process. You usually build it, then you run a whole year in parallel of both systems to make sure you're getting all your financials recorded the right way. Right. But we do have backups. So we, we have backups, yes, yes, we have backups. But the point being is that our backups are, you know, we we rent some space in other places for backups, you know, and such, but you know, we have a basement room downstairs with three air conditioners in it to really manage our evidence from the police department and the Tyler financial system because we're on premises. It is a big bill to go up to the cloud. They, they, they know they got you going to the cloud, but it is where data is more secure, right? Because they have to apply a whole load of standards from CISA that we uh, don't have to apply and such. That's what we should build here. It's a data farm? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm getting off the subject here. Look, it's so, but the three air conditioners we got down. And, yeah. <laughs> so is it that room fireproof or is it? Well, it's fireproof of the fact that it is fully concrete. <laughs> um, I don't, it is not, it is not as secure as you were thinking of it. Sir. Okay. So it is, uh, it's literally located off the locker room for the police department. So theoretically, you can have a water flow in issue there. Um, it is all concrete. And I mean, those air conditioners go up with some holes. We cut through concrete to get venting out. Um, so it is not the ideal room. When this place was redesigned, it was meant to be sort of right behind the front desk and what is the mail room in that area, what is now planning development where the file room was. You were giving all the cybersecurity secrets away. <laughs> Well, from a, from number one to ten, what exposure do we have with ten being oh, the great yeah. insurance? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but soon as I can get that information back to us, you know. So we're 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 um we have backups, and so but someone it's not hard for someone to get to our room if they are not supposed to be there. Yeah, and I guess that's what my question is: is that or we protected? You know, if something yes. like that happens. Yes. These departments on site. <laughs> Working out. Our oh, right so. next door. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. Right. I'm not trying to. No, no, I understand. So that's the type of risk analysis yeah. you really need to think about. Oh, yeah. And that's that, part of this. That, if part, that yeah. happens, I think mm -hmm. probably in conversation with you and me, Dr. Peoples, you know, do we have a, a, a disaster recovery plan? What happens if this building goes poof? Where do we go? Where, what do we do? Uh, do you have we plan? do have plans. We don't have a lot of good answers in those plans. I would say that, yes, we need assistance doing this. Uh, in between the 3.5, 3.7 staff in finance? 3.7. I would support that. I mean, looking at the reports that are here, yeah, looking at lot. that spreadsheet, I mean, it's a lot, but you get a lot of good information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we really need that information to be able to really address the questions. And what better way to spend some of our reserve money to figure out how to spend <laughs> some of our reserve money? <laughs> 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 
of government. <laughs> the other question I had, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, aside from having the expertise, because I, do we have the capacity? Could we get it done? Yes. Would it be quick? Absolutely not. Um, but having somebody with a different lens help us look at this and, and to tell us the hard truths, quite frankly, that we need to hear about some of this. That helps us if we need to talk about it in the community, too. Yeah. Well. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned that this has been kind of the same bucket of money for 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. So do we anticipate that we have $12 million, say, that we need to, to work with? Do we think that's going to go up and down in the future? Or is it really like we need to figure out what we need and we're going to set it, but really the amount is it going to change that much to your year because we're still dealing with the same bucket of money that we have? I think in general, barring major volatility in the economy, you're going to deal with about the same amount of budget revenue that you're getting. Right? That's the way the Hancock Amendment sort of kicks us in the behind, right? New construction, you're going to need some more property, property taxes. That, that helps. Um, sales tax, obviously, if you add another sales tax, increase one of the taxes that's eligible to be in tax, increase, that helps. But again, Sales tax is going to dip as the economy dips and such, so you're going to have to build some triggers in. The other revenues are generally staying pretty, pretty, um, pretty constant across the way. Again, legislature preemption, big one. You know, sooner or later, someone's going to say something about why do you have these A or B boards? Why do you take the wise building permits this much? Why do you do business licenses? Half the half the business license businesses aren't are exempt already. You know, I'm surprised that some of them haven't gone to the legislature and said, "Get us all out of this." So. Um, so that again, an exposure in those risks. Um, but again, your costs are still, you're still in a people model. You know, we're always going to be a people model. I, Dr. Peoples is absolutely right. People's are, people are the, the bedrock of government. Um, people are going to cost more and more. And we're young in the pension. Like our costs at loggers are young. We are not you know, an aged organization like St. Louis County trying to cover pension liabilities. We are a young organization in terms of pain in the pension. So that liability balloon is out there waiting for us to, to bump into it someday. And so there are those conversations. If we can carry all this money forward, that's not going to be enough when we get there to, to meet all those needs and, and demands. So has, has that required our pensions? I mean, like state law that we cover? No. That they recover? I know. Oh. Yeah. We, no. we we were once in a, would be a five, what's a non-pension, but yeah. we were essentially a 401k version for government. We did have that. Uh, we did not have pensions. Uh, there was a original pension that's in the charter. You see that uh, fire and police were in that. Some police were in that. Not everyone. Uh, that was slowly phased out. Probably right about the time you came to council, um, the the verba they used to call it uh, was phased out as we moved into loggers and really, you know, the two public safety services really pushed into getting into a you know, the logger system. Uh, the logger system is a very good system. I want to be very clear. It's a very good system. But ultimately, we're still young. I mean, I look at our actuarial reports, and we have young years of service. We don't have a bunch. We have, some departments have four retirees. You know, we've been in the city for since eighteen ninety six. We have four retirees drawing a pension benefit. So we are we have we're new to that world, and that means that those experiences that governments have with you have pension load from thirty years ago that you're paying off now, that's going to come to us at some point in the future. I will not have to deal with that flight crisis. You will not have to deal with it. But how do we best leave our successors with some semblance of a pathway forward? I just know some organizations, not necessarily city governments, but they're getting rid of their pensions and becoming self-funding in with their 401ks. Most 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 private sector agencies are certainly out of pensions. That's guaranteed. Public sector is still very strong in pensions. Uh, we can leave a pension, but those who are vested have a right to continue. So once. Once you're in invested, even though we may say we're done with a pension, those that have reached five years and are vested in lawyers, we would have to continue that pension payment for them. And by law, we're required to maintain that at a certain balance. I don't know by law. So by logger, no, by logger systems, loggers require this, but not, not law. Not law. No. Contractually, though, for departments that have collective bargaining agreements, we're in it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think uh, moving on, we've talked about a lot of these questions, but these are the four big ones about your values and where do we put money behind our, our values and such. Uh, on a reserve policy, we're talking about what's that pre-guidance that we're looking for. We're going to have a large amount of reserves that aren't going to be necessary to cover risk. 
That's a, that's a likely statement I'm making there. I think it's very likely. I mean, I put 99.9% truth behind that, but that was caveat that data could come up. We have a big exposure somewhere we don't know about. But again, so if you're going to have millions potentially, what are those? What are those programs and spending areas are your priorities? What are the priorities? That, you know, is it the things in the strategic plan or are the things not covered in that? Um, what are your personal greatest hopes and fears? What keeps you awake at night about the city? You know, is it is it cybersecurity? Is that really you know causing? Is that an angst? And is that angst something that we should put money towards? You know, that's a great way to start a policy conversation. What can we plan and what can we manage for? Right? I mean, there's some things we can't plan and manage for. So how do we pre book pre guidance on it? We know how to plan for an ERP transition, how to plan for we're going to have a cybersecurity attack. Here's how we're going to respond and such like that. We can't plan for, we can plan for what we do with an earthquake. We can't say the earthquake's going to come here and make our budget projections all look pretty the way we wanted it to. It's going to come in the year when we don't want it to happen, right? You know, Candlestick Park, you know, in the, the 89 World Series with earthquake in San Francisco wasn't planned, right? How old are you? I was... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to talk about the 53 Mother's Day tornado in, up in Wisconsin too. So, um, and then I think out of this conversation, you know, we had back people. I think the words would be it was a struggle to get this meeting scheduled and sort of put together. But what's your what's your goals and desires? Like, when do you want to bring this back and talk about it again? If we if we're just having an esoteric policy conversation. Is this something you want to meet every month, or is this wait for data to get back? You know, I feel like we need the data and I feel like we need the um, priorities, tasks, you know, that conversation too, to see what more pockets we need to, I don't know. So. But, but there are questions that, that we can answer now, you know, what in the event that we do, whatever we do with the comprehensive reserve policy and those funds that we set us, think we're going to set aside, what are we going to do with them? Because if we don't name it, somebody is going to try to claim it. You know, and it won't be for any type of significant thing that we want to accomplish, like the you know, field or some type of problem. Explain what you're saying, Emerson. I'm a little confused. I'm sorry. Well, let's say, for example, we have the, uh, the uh, reserve. We create a policy and say, well, all we need is X amount of dollars for a rainy day, whatever you want to call it. Then now, Two, three, four, five million might become a bill. What parameters are we going to put against that? So that we can't say, well, let's go ahead and put a nice flower garden down here on yeah. this street. You know, we get to make sure there's something that the entire community, city, Webster Road, is going to benefit off of. Yeah. You know, like the street repair, or if it's something that happens uh, in an emergency. Remember the, uh, the flood. Everybody, or everybody counts their flood insurance, but they want the city to bail them out. Well, you know, that kind of something can happen. But we do need to set parameters on that money so we know what it's going to be used for and how it's going to be used for the betterment of the city. Give that money back to the community. Well, I think we made a comment. Thank you, Bob. To, to, so they can see the efforts of the tax money. Yes, I feel like Whatever, if we were to change any policy, it has to be a staggered policy. In other words, I don't think we can say we're going to go from 50% to 10% overnight. I think it's got to be done over the course of multiple years in order for people to feel comfortable, mm -hmm. in order for us to prove that it is okay to do. Mm -hmm. And then it also allows for the money to be spent uh, if any money is spent, to be spent over the course of multiple years rather than all at once. Very yeah. yeah, you can have it over maybe five, seven year period. Exactly. And, and see how we use this money this year, mm -hmm. and then, you know, then put to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Money, people won't spend it. Then we don't have money. How come you don't? Well, with our comprehensive plan process that we're going through, um, you know, that would identify some, you know, goals, help us identify some goals and, and, um, and how we would want to, you know, utilize some of these funds to achieve some of those goals. But do we want to wait until the results of the comprehensive plan 
come back to start. Well, I think this is a very fast process. Anyway. It's not fast, but maybe some type of a policy might get put us on the path. Policy that you might review every year and make changes and modifications to it to improve it. Yeah, I'm not it's saying like, let's not do anything right now. What I'm saying is like down the line, I think that will be, we're lucky to be able to have those points to reference in addressing how to spend the money. You know, the massive community engagement that was the first leg of this, this will be very informative for us. Good. Well, you don't want to happen. You'll be here, I'll be here. And if, if, if David's going to run again, you might be gone. And so this group next up, Pam and the mayor, I mean, they, they might, but we want to create something that's going to move from council to council to council, where it will be difficult for them to change and to, uh, for them to explain why they're doing it. But otherwise, it, yeah, I don't disagree that we, you know, this is, we need to be having this conversation of how much is an okay amount of money to keep on yeah. um, reserves and then determine what to do with it. I think that'll be a full council thing, right? That won't be a, Oh, no. You know, just, I don't want to sit and wait for a comprehensive plan because if we get it next year, we'll be lucky. It can be done contemporaneously, right? I agree yeah. with you. But mm -hmm. I was wondering, like, is the first thing that maybe to assist in this would be let's find a, a third party yeah. consultant to assist? Would that be the first step here? I think it's twofold. I think we need that third party, and whether we are a theater or a source, mm -hmm. we can figure that piece yeah. out. So I, I think that happens simultaneously with the prioritization conversation. With the council. With council. Oh, yeah. yeah. With I mean, council. that's what you're looking for the council to do. I am. Um, and even if it's not strictly defined how much dollars you want to put to X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. really understanding what those priorities are. Yeah, doing some really serious ranking and, mm -hmm. and sticking to it uh, because we've had we've had quite a bit of mission creep, I think, from the strategic plan. And that's not necessarily a negative thing. We've done a lot of important things. But as we're really prioritizing that will help me then to be able to go back, work with teams, work with finance. What are the costs going to be? What are the staff costs associated with it? Because any of the priorities you all come up with come with additional staff. And you've heard me talk, you know, through budget and other times, we're a much leaner team than we were. Some of that is because we just can't fill positions. You know, I think we're still down 10 police officers. If we're trying as much as we can. So we're lean. And any work that we do or priorities that come about, we also have to have the capital and human resources to put in that, which comes at a cost. And even without being, Eric, I'm going to call on you for some, some numbers, even without those positions, you know, we froze and we withheld as we were going through. And I think we're still down 14 of those positions. Is 14, right? 14 of those positions. And so, but the work has not decreased. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If anything, it's increased. Which kind of supports your approach of, of spreading this out over mm -hmm. several years because we'll need to do that for staff time too. We can't do it all oh. in a year or two. Yeah. My, my biggest concern with that is, say, is without a dollar value, it's hard to figure out what my priorities may be. Because if I have $6 million to spend or to figure out what should be prioritized, that's different than $2 million in my mm -hmm. life. So I, I think we can do that from a high level, maybe, but it's going to be, I think, difficult for me to say, um, this is my priority based off of this without knowing numbers. So I agree. And I, I agree fully. I think it could be more philosophical or yeah. chicken or egg. When I'm thinking about it, I've got some real big things in my mind. I hear from probably half the council that stormwater is the top priority. It's incredibly important across the city. I fully agree. Uh, but some of the sustainability things, composting is on my mind. Um, some of the activities that we're doing, all good things. Mm -hmm. Things that we're doing in the business districts is supporting the business districts, you know, a top priority. Having just some of that will help, I think, us narrow it down. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so like, you know, and this council's talked a lot about affordable housing. We Thank talked you. about walkability. Yes. And so it's like, even if it's like, uh, Structuring how we spend the money around those ideas, yeah. not necessarily what the project, uh, project is. Right. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. So I like in my mind, I've got like three buckets. We've got that, you know, prioritizing areas of mm -hmm. priority, um, <laughs> doing the project to find out what the numbers are, what the recommendations are, getting that third party in to do the reports like we have um, from Salt Lake and others, and then the the policy itself and these kind of questions of like, do we do we do a range. What are the triggers? What do we, you know, what happens? So kind of like those three pieces of it. As far as like meeting again, I feel like we can't, for me, like, I feel like I can't really do much more until we kind of start down the road of getting that analysis. That's analysis of? Our, our. Risks. Risks. Our risks. Mm -hmm. Is that something that council feels? No, no, no. I think that's the GFA yeah. model, right? It's a matter of us, as we talked about capacity internally, and there are people that we can, we can, again, we can go RP, we can sole source, we can figure out people to bring to that conversation okay. that will speed that conversation, the speed of reporting yeah. up and such. Uh, again, don't think of these those one time, right? Because every year they, they analyze that. What what is the weather pattern stuff? What is the what's the actuarial risk behind the earthquake? If it didn't happen this year, what does that mean for ten years out, right? Um, if you're in a wildfire country and you didn't burn this year, are you going to burn next year? You know, things like that. Um, so these are not just one-time moments that happen. They're going to give us that sense in the beginning. But that's why this whole policy is on a triennial review. Every three years, we're talking about this very basic thing. Are we still within our ranges and where we need to be uh, on, on, on having a reserve? And, what, and for what purpose? I can give my thoughts on that. I think we should do triennial to be in line with all the other policies. Yeah. So Thank you. Need, like, Thank you. We got one. We got one there. One opinion right? yeah. on one thing. Yeah. And it's you know we let's be clear. For twelve years, we didn't look at this policy, right? yeah. uh, other than the conversation, whatever happened in budget. Mm -hmm. But it was not done a review of it, and so sort of luckily timed in with where GFOA is at to give us some resources that we didn't have to come up with this ourselves, right? We didn't have to pull actuarials in. We were able to look at what other cities are doing, what other folks in the finance world are are suggesting. That you know gives us some guidance here. And I think this document also will help with. I know what your priorities, which is this emergency preparedness and plans. So much of that risk assessment speaks to what are the real risks that we look, need to look at. I thought it was interesting that the different cities had different areas of mm -hmm. risks for that. Sure. Um, yeah. We need to get like the one in Napa Valley where their big risk was their uh, their transient occupancy. Right. To add to no. or, uh, to no. Just think <laughs> where we'll be if back in the world. And they bought the sold the water company in 2001, 22, mm -hmm. somewhere there. Yeah. Didn't have this bucket of money to fall on that lap. If we didn't have that bucket of money, we're probably much, much smaller than what we are now. Because we never had, we didn't have that 12 million a little bit back in our mind as the safety net. Mm -hmm. it, it just, we, I don't think we've been able to grow that type of pool of money in this city. And that goes to the not just basing this based on what the numbers say, but what the values are and like what we feel is right. Because we might, what if the numbers say 12, but we're like, if we had 12, we wouldn't be willing to like risk this or that. We need 20 or 25. It is interesting though, when you talk about values, right? Like, I mean, we've had that for 20 years. Mm -hmm. and no one really has run or no one, you don't see a swell in the community that we want this money spent immediately on some project. So I, I do think that even though that money kind of did not did fall in our lap, but like that money's there, the community feels protected with that money there. So a decent chunk of change seems to me that having that there is a value in this community. Oh, I do. Yeah. I, I guess I was really questioning how many of our community members know that bucket of money is there. I Well, once you explain it, how we're explaining it now, you know, well, how would that value change? I agree with what you're saying. Right. And, that's, and, and that's the importance of that policy. Yeah. This is how we're going to handle the response. From yeah. Whatever yeah. the number is of people who know that it's there, it's going up because we're having meetings like this. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Which is a good, which is a good. The goal setting meeting is scheduled for the next council meeting. Okay. I have to pull up the council calendar to see. So that conversation will be quick. I'll get my pen out and start writing. <laughs> I, do, I do think as you, and I know it's down the road, you're talking about money, right? And you, David, you talked about what amount, right? And even if you take, in my mind, you take the graduate approach. If I take seven years, I'll say we 25% is where we all arrive at, right? Between values and data, you know, we own 25%. You're going to end up with, eight to nine million dollars you know of investment to make 
where does that do the best work, right? And now, God bless all city councils and all the councils I've ever worked for on boards, but we have seven members and I can see seven priorities come out, right? Mm -hmm. Do you then effectively scale anything that is meaningful to the community with that money? Even on that, if you have, you know, how many, how many priorities can you really scale up? That's the other thing we don't think about often is scaling, right? We've, we've made some really uh, bold, I don't know, but we took some steps like during, um, we did work in Webster Groves, you know, very simple job board for businesses during COVID. But it's not scaled, right? We didn't put years of, of brand advertising in behind that to make it the indeed of what we talked about here, right? It was, a, we'll meet the need now. It's a product that's there. We'll always have this job board. But at scaling up, we don't do a lot of that. We need a need in the moment, but we don't scale it up to how to affect the community outcomes longer and further down the road. Well, and to kind of piggyback off of that, right? Like, and this probably goes back to the risk analysis, but like, how much of this can we buy? You know, like, mm -hmm. like they say, we want to build a new city hall. Mm -hmm. I mean, that seems to me not money that we would use from our reserve. We would just go out to the citizens for a bond issue. Right? And same thing with maybe some of the green energy stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of that stuff is, and, and even the strong water stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. I think all that kind of stuff is potentially more more appropriate for bond related stuff. We have, we have a lot of space. If you're going to be in bonding, there's a lot of costs that can be bonded. And we have certainly a lot of capacity, even as I reported on the tax rates, you know, seven cents on the dollar, that's a that's a little chunk of bond, you know, that you could probably just totally guessing you could probably roll another six million dollar bond out right now under that tax rate. But if we were at that tax rate, the, the maximum we're allowed at across the years without increasing that tax rate the maximum. Okay. So that's being honest, you know. It's the route with Dr. Peoples and Eric, you know, we've gotten quite a you chunks of or grants. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not a not hundred thousand, we're talking about millions to go back into the city. So that's 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 big. And there's money. I think I got an email one day last week. I think uh, they just opened up four forty million in um for uh Disaster, not disaster recovery, but, but waste waste management. Or something. Oh, like that. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. we took so, quite a few grants in the hopper right now as well. So, yeah. You know. And yeah. that's another area. That speaks to the finance, wherever I was going, finance infrastructure. That's yeah. a whole other mod finance module that we have to sort of build. The cost I mean, exactly. There is Where's a, that money come from? Yep. That's where I think like, this there's, is interesting, right? Like, so uh, however many millions of dollars we have to spend, I mean, we're not like, building a land bridge over 44, which is my dream Yeah. Um, with that. But, you know, what What can we be doing foundationally, both like as for tax base mm -hmm. and then also capacity here? That's an investment. Yes. And we're leveraging dollars we have quite a bit, I mean, through the grants, which is a great time right mm -hmm. now to do that. But there are match costs, and yes. then there's ongoing costs right. to that if we want to continue whatever those activities are. There's very few grants that will just build your infrastructure and let you walk away. Right. right. There's programs. But we're still going after several. Um, and you all will continue to hear me talk about infrastructure as we have these conversations. I think the IT plan that Eric already talked about, switching to the cloud, switching our ERP system. Uh, but we still have a lot of deferred building maintenance. Mm -hmm. we, we've got to, in my mind, to take care of some of the mm -hmm. first things first. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we managed to do that. And one of, one of the things I was asking about, about like how much this fluctuates is really we kind of have to think about whatever we pull out of the fund balance to spend as one time money. Like, Absolutely. We, oh, yeah. So we have to be careful about like using it for costs that are going to continue mm -hmm. after we've spent or that number much it is. Mm -hmm. So the deferred maintenance, things like mm -hmm. that, Things that can help our tax base. Mm -hmm. It's a circular conversation. We're back where we started. Mm -hmm. How do we increase revenues? Mm -hmm. And you know, and that money we have invested, that's the whatever's left into the reserve. We're going to earn money on it. Do we let that stay in there? Do we draw it out every five years? And do something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's earning interest now. It does earn interest now. I think, you know, obviously because of our rightful. Investment policies, we, we, we maximize safety. So when numbers are going to fall here in this quarter, probably, you know, we haven't, we haven't gone to bond yet because we're waiting just for that one more month. Can we, if we drop, can we, we're going to say millions 
waiting for that one Fed, Fed rate change, right? On, yeah. 30, on those bonds. So just by waiting, and there, there's another benefit. We hold a big chunk of cash there that I can obligate for the pool now and backfill with the bonds by saving millions in interest. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? By waiting a month and such. So, um, you know, that's that's a nice a nice feature of having all that cash. But there are, to your point, you can put investments in, to create a grant, a grant match trust fund. You can create a trust fund within your own city. Uh, this is for grant match. We're setting aside a million dollars. That million dollars is now going to keep growing and keeps growing and keeps growing and keeps growing. And that's where we're going to pull match off. That's a yep. good idea. You know, um, we talked about if you are interested in and if the council truly does want a, a charitable organization on the outside, right? There's one time money that you're saying we're going to seed. It's going back to our community and we're going to put money into that. That's a possibility. Um, there's all sorts of different ways to, to go about using that. But again, that's the priorities and what's the values and internally, what do we need? And then what does our community need? Where do we put? The money they invested for years in the water program, where would we take that to work for them? You know, so all those both those things though do require uh, staff, right? Like an ongoing staff resources, right? So and that's the thing that concerns. I'm sorry, I'm just thinking through this. I, I love the idea of using this money mm -hmm. that will effectively pay for itself, mm -hmm. like something that's gonna yeah. continue, like commercially or something, a venue out of the one, but. When I think about the trust or when I think about the uh, uh, the charitable, mm -hmm. just seems to me just to be uh, <laughs> you can't have staff yourself kind of like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Charitable stuff can be, certainly, yes. I think the grant trust fund, and don't think of trust fund like a charitable organization when it's an internal, because it's under our investment policy. Okay. So I'm talking about our own dedicated grant fund, the trust fund, I'm going to trust fund. But then we have to figure out what are the policies and procedures in order to spend that. Uh, right, uh, and that's good. We need to write grant policy in it. I mean, we're, we're, coming into, exactly, right? <laughs> we're coming into that right now, though. I mean, what, how do we deal with grants? Because in for years, it's been a couple hundred thousand dollars of grants, yeah. mostly in police. Well, we are struggling with that. I think yeah. that's a fair mm -hmm. word, especially for the federal grants that we're getting. And we've got a terrific 3.7 finance team. But they do not have the capacity or the expertise to submit the federal yeah. grants. And we're writing the grants and using our, our grant match company, but they don't. There's a lot of reporting, and we want to make sure that we're reporting appropriately, keeping mm -hmm. up with it, and doing all the vendor verifications things that we need to. So, staff capacity beyond not having enough staff. What and whether it's not even necessarily number of staff. It's having staff with the skill sets that we need to continue into the things that we're doing. You know, if we're going to continue talking about sustainability, do we really invest in a staff person that has that sustainability background, is able to go do various inventories? I mean, we're doing great. And we're each year's our sustainability champion. And we're doing great to have this first sustainability mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. um, but we've pulled it together. How do we make it meaningful going forward? And, and I, that is spot on, I think, with every industry, yep. uh, right? Like in the idea of like the changing workforce, it's literally a workforce that is changing for the people that used to, you know, pave the streets. You're not hiring those people anymore. You're hiring someone who knows how to uh, fix the machine that paves the streets. Right. And it's like that, I, th I think it's so important to think of that. And also also to, to educate the public about that too, because... Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge shift in mentality of what government does. It's a huge shift. And we've got some large position changes coming in the sit in the full budget discussion. But even along those lines, you know, our, our maintenance workers. And we've got terrific team members. Uh, but, you know, our, our maintenance workers that we're used to working on some of our old school cars, what are they doing with the e vehicles? Even when we start talking about the hybrids. And so we've got to pivot. And how are we either training them to invest in them? Or are we outsourcing it? There's there's just a lot of conversations. Yeah, you know, excellent. Uh, but uh, example of that two two three years ago, I guess when I first came to the council, I was screaming about the path, walking path around Ivy Cracker Park where it cracks. You know, mm -hmm. we can't do it because it's too expensive. You know what? You know, and somebody came and tapped me on the shoulder and said. Emerson, we can do that. All we have to do is buy the concrete. It was done in the house, you know, but it, we was used to just putting all that. I mean, we had the people in the house, the talent, mm -hmm. but we wouldn't use it. I would love to invest more in our in-house staff. We're doing our own uh, 
CDL training program now, which is great. Yeah. You know, we have find people to train. But yes, we're doing it when we can find them. Yeah. So uh, yeah, there's so it takes time. Yeah. I think we're on a good path. We are. We are a, we've got a lot of great things happening. What do you say you think the bet for the balance in the reserve should be? Mm. Me? No. Mm. I'm not gonna deny that. <laughs> that is no. No. That is you all as well. I don't know. I'm just saying if my numbers are being rehearsed to you. Are you called? <laughs> <laughs> Eric will bring recommendations. We really want to hear the conversation from you all. Um, and I think next council meeting will help a lot for that prioritization or goal setting, whatever it is we're calling it, conversation. And honestly, it's, we need to stay away from those feeling decisions versus data driven. But it's always going to be both. Yeah. I know, but we need to stay away from it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, it might not make, you know, I, I, can't be all of them. Affordable and attainable housing. I, that's that's one of my pet peeves. Amy's is sustainability. I'm well, also with you on housing. Though. You know, but you know, we might not even do it all. Oh, yeah. you know, we might even do some, but not all. You know, and that idea of not fracturing things seven different ways, right. but picking something what, as a What do you actually company. do that makes that so impact? Hard. That's going to be the greatest impact. Plus the priorities. Yeah. Yeah. I, See, the, I think but, emotions and feelings are so important right? because what our job is is to make people's lives simpler and better and easier. And so sometimes data doesn't drive that. No. You know, data, data is important. Don't get me wrong. I, I am a big fan of data. The data and data and Yeah. But I, you know, I think that when from a governmental, especially the local level, you know, if, if a planter on the side of the street is going to make community better, even though it costs money to have someone go out and water it every day. Sometimes that's what you do. Yeah. It's the, it's the vibes. Yeah. It's the vibes. <laughs> I think a lot of decisions in the past. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a valid point. It's yeah. data. Yeah. It's just a different kind of data. Absolutely. Yeah. So, ma'am, you're saying our goal setting meeting is the 17th. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that is... We have is and is this going to be with the strate understanding where we are in the strategic plan and the tactics and when's that? Oh, okay, it's fabulous. It's going to be some of that. I'm not sure how much of a deep dive. That's or, yeah, pulling it together. But yes, there will be some. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and we've moved ahead on the strategic plan. I mean, believe it or not, there's so much that has been. There is. There's so much that's been done, especially. Um, I, don't know on the staff side. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. I don't know how much goes. I mean, we, we do some stuff too, but uh, a ton is being done on the staff side. Too. side. It's kind of like when you're putting tons of money in your, I don't know, if your furnace, it's not much fun because it's things you don't see. It's um, um, sexy ways to spend money. It, it is. But staff have been doing some amazing things. And not all of it's flashy, but whether it's our hiring practices, whether it's just internal skills and team building. We really are doing some great things. Yeah. I'm we have seventy-seven million dollars of assets. The biggest one's not flashy at all. Road wheel drive on. It's the biggest set of asset we have other than, other than people. So wow. when you look at our balance sheet, that's, that's the biggest asset we own is payment. It's unfortunate, <laughs> but it's the biggest asset we own. In terms of scheduling, mm -hmm. I think I will wait to Hound you all with more doodle holes until after the goal setting meeting. Okay. My councilman Franklin stepped out. He's be back. Oh, it was incredibly hard to schedule. And if you'll remember during the budget season, you all did want to have these additional work sessions, which is fine. It would help me to know how often we're talking about having these the times of day that are best, on whether it's evening, day. We'll make ourselves available. But that once a month, is every other month. So I'll ask some of those questions as we move forward. Or the third party piece of it, is yes. that something that full council needs to approve or is that something that you already have what you Eventually, need for? No, we'll move forward and see what kind of costs we can That's get. Possible. And it may be able to sole source it depending on costs that would come back to council. Obviously we'll discuss the process, but I'm not, I honestly don't know. I don't know if that's a $5,000 thing, a $20,000 thing. We can take it up in a minute. 
I think so. I think yeah. so. Really. I mean, I'm. <laughs> Vote yeah, yeah. I'm just curious on the process. Yeah. I think you should like, when you have a and in a work session care. say, and when are we meeting and schedule it that way instead of trying to chase us down with a doodle poll. It's so much to be a doodle poll. Oh, yeah. man. Yes, we did. It was rough. I don't think I used that doodle poll. You sure did. Let's talk about that. Still running. <laughs> and that's the case, just ignore me. <laughs> Well, I think that's, we do is scheduling it, and then whoever is available. Yeah, that's how I like yeah. to think about it. But I understand too. Till three, four years, we even use self committees to get stuff done. Yeah, those first couple of years, they, yeah, they we yeah. didn't really have self committees. Didn't was, get done on the first and the third. Wait to the next first and third, and finally month to get it done. Yeah. Well, this is great. When you all <laughs> made the decision to do this, it was clear that not everybody would be present. So having four here. This is a win. And, and like the great thing is it's recorded. So yeah. Like, I mean, if I yeah. miss tonight, I can go back and then right. I can put my two cents in or for whatever that's worth, you know, later that's on. Maybe I'll know that. Yeah. 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 One and a half cents. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys. This has been No, oh, thank you. It's, it's been very stuff. helpful. It's it's an anxiety, like I like I said, it's an anxiety driven conversation sometimes, but it's extremely important. It's a little bit exciting. Yeah. Much Sometimes exciting. Yeah, exciting. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this is contributing to the infrastructure for future years. Yeah. Yeah. So future councils. Yeah. 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 Well, I think for especially the past couple of years when we've talked about the idea of where our budget is and everything like that, to be able to tell the public now that we're thinking about investing. To make everybody with their tax fair money that goes along with as well. Mm -hmm. But they are. That they've already paid. Yeah. <laughs> We're not knocking on your door again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they have the comment they made or and we made, you know, if it's something they want to do with sewer, money, okay. But I was special tax fair. You get it done, you get it done correctly. Right. Instead of fixing it over on this street first and then over on this street, just have a plan to get it done. I think we're going to be dealing with flooding issues for <laughs> the remainder of both of our lives. Well, it's just that. Uh, I suspect when we get these stormwater master plan back, that we could spend all of the reserve on the stormwater master. Plan. Then some, <laughs> probably. Well, times, sure, four times over. So. Yeah. yeah, I was going to so, say yeah. it's like a little wink. Yeah, I think we we took took a bunch of farmland in the forties and fifties and said, oh yeah, we'll run the water down that gully and you know maybe channelize it and then to this. We don't we obviously don't have a lot of storm drains in some places. Well, it's kind of like even with Brentwood Bow. I mean, mm -hmm. that with their construction there probably caused us some flooding issues too. That's exactly what we're going to continue to do when the county does it. And we don't care. And we don't care. We don't care. Okay. Somebody, somebody need to say we're adjourned. Yeah, that's you. I would love to see MSC disband. Just putting that on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Adjourned. Uh, adjourned. <laughs>